around to you. Thank you. And we really do appreciate you hanging in there with the tight quarters. Promise that next year it's going to be huge. Plenty of room. All right. Thanks. Um, you know, I've given the, I opened my big mouth up and uh, offered to uh, do the scholarship recipients. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the qualifications and the accomplishments of these two students are so extensive. Uh, I'm not sure I could do any justice, uh, even in, in, in summation form. Uh, but I'm going to give it a shot because I'm, I'm awfully proud of the two recipients of this year's uh, El Elgin Hispanic Networks uh, Scholarship. As many of you know, uh, we've been awarding the scholarship for, for many years now, and in the past, the amount has varied. Uh, this last year, uh, for 2000, we had two $1,000 scholarships that we awarded uh, to uh, two, high, two local high school uh, students. You'll see on your uh, program, uh, Ciris Rivas and Lydia Feliciano. Uh, I always feel I have to make this disclaimer. Uh, that Lydia is not a relation with me that, that I know of, and so there's no in dealing here. But uh, she, she certainly deserves, uh, deserves this scholarship. Uh, I'd like to start just a, a couple of highlights. Uh, unfortunately, the, neither one of the two uh, recipients could uh, make it today. Uh, simply because it's just awfully difficult, not only with the distance, but with the, uh, some of them I think have midterms or finals, uh, always a tough time of year for, for students to get out and, and come here for, for lunch. And so, um, uh, in any event, I've got uh, at least to present uh, the certificate for, 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 for the girls. Uh, I'd like to start off in your program, Ciras uh, Rivas. Now, Ciras, again, I, let me just give you a couple of things about this. It's just, the lady's tremendous. Uh, she's uh, the Hispanic Honor Roll Mention student uh, presently. She's on a tennis team. Uh, she's uh, part of the Fine Arts Club. Uh, she's a volunteer for the Crisis Line in Fox Valley. Uh, she's at Elgin Fox Theater. She's worked there. She's babysitter. She's, she's an honor student. She's uh, a student at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy. Um, and um, just a, a, an incredible uh, resume and, and background that, that, that this lady has. I'd like to since she's, although she's not here, and I don't know if anybody's here to, uh, you know, as an agent, but I'd like to at least give her the certificate. Uh, checks have already been cut, uh, so <laughs> don't, don't worry much about that. We, we're good for that. Uh, but uh, we have one for her, which uh, we'll be sending uh, to her. And uh, we do have the pleasure of at least having, although we're unable to get the student, at least having her mother here present with us, and that would be uh, Lydia Feliciano. Uh, Mrs. Feliciano, if you could uh, step up here and uh, we'll like to award. Yes, definitely. And on behalf of the Elgin Hispanic Network, I'd like to uh, present uh, your daughter with that certificate for uh, the, it says 1999, it's really 2000 uh, scholarship <laughs> award. Uh, you can blame the president for that, but uh, we'll get the politics and send her the right one. But uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we're all very proud of, of Lydia. I've got just a couple things to say uh, about her. I mean, uh, again, very similar to the other scholarship winner, just uh, so many things. Uh, President of La Raza and, uh, at Larkin, uh, honor student, she's with the newspaper. Uh, she, she has an interest that's uh, always been a, a love of mine, which is photography. And um, unlike me, of course, she's won uh, awards. Um, and uh, she's been involved with the Spanish Club, the National Honor Society, uh, and just a host of things. You guys can see uh, the, the paperwork on their accomplishments uh, speaks uh, just volumes. And, uh, and I just want to thank uh, Lydia's mother for coming out here today. I don't know if, if you want to say anything, we would appreciate it. I'll, I'll hold this well, good afternoon. And my name is also Lydia Feliciano. So I would like to thank the LG Hispanic Network in, in, on her behalf of the scholarship. Um, this has been a dream for her to be able to continue her education. Um, like um, Gilbert said, she's actually today attending classes at Northern University, and she's right now m uh, majoring in marketing. So in behalf of the Elgin Hispanic Network, I really appreciate and thank you for the scholarship that you have awarded her. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda, um, we would probably, if I did this part, uh, we would enter into the world of the surreal. So I'm giving the mic over to our uh, correspondent secretary, uh, Julio Cesar Valdez. Oh, the one is Jones. Good afternoon.
afternoon. Um, as Gil said, my name is Julio Cesar Valdez, and I'm an attorney here in Elgin, and I have the honor of serving the, as Correspondent Secretary for the Elgin Hispanic Network. I um, have the honor, although he might think that this is a torment, of uh, presenting the award for the, the Outstanding Member Award uh, for the network. Each year this is given out to a member who's demonstrated uh, out them. I have a great deal of respect for him, and I'd like everyone to welcome Gilbert and uh, recognize his receiving this award. I guess to say it, I'm somewhat embarrassed as an understatement, but uh, I do, I, I appreciate it. I, I thank everyone uh, who participated in the voting, the nomination. Uh, frankly, I, I suppose it, it sounds somewhat cliche-ish to say that uh, it'd be presumptuous to think that, just because it bears my name, that uh, I'm the one solely responsible for it. Uh, it really isn't. Uh, I think this year, particularly this year, more than, than any others that I've been involved, uh, the network has really been uh, a true working network. I've, there's no way in the world that I could have even gotten close to being nominated for this without the help of my officers, the other executive uh, team, as well as the 50 plus members that are in our organization. So it uh, really goes out to everybody, even though that sounds cliche, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you. The next award we'll be presenting goes out to the organization, which has also demonstrated outstanding service, commitment, uh, and in many ways has assisted the Hispanic Network uh, in a variety of uh, capacities. Uh, one of the things I would like to say, because I think it, it, it needs to be said, uh, is the members from this organization, which we're going to recognize, are very instrumental in all the work the network has uh, done. Uh, in that sense, we are very appreciative of the efforts that on top of the, the jobs that they hold with their organization, uh, the work that they do for the Hispanic Network. Uh, that said, we would like to present the organizational award to the Community Crisis Center. Forum at Elgin Community College, 
Uh, and in there, there was a panel of uh, highly qualified um, uh, people representing various views of uh, issues related to the Latino community. Manny Barbosa was one of those, and he uh, had several things that uh, were really enlightening, and I, and, I, and I felt that something that probably ought to maybe have a, a, an additional forum. Uh, the message was powerful, and I, and I asked him as a result of that if he wouldn't mind coming here today and just spending a few minutes uh, discussing some of that or, or some issues that are tangential to that. Uh, he agreed. Um, in the past, as many of you know, uh, we don't make it a habit to have a feature or keynote speaker because, frankly, we just want you to have just eat and have some fun. <laughs> but uh, I think the message uh, is important enough uh, that uh, I'm glad Manny's here for that. Uh, a little bit about uh, Manny. He uh, was born in Mexico. He lived in Elgin over, he's lived in Elgin for over 40 years. Uh, he taught elementary, secondary, adult education in Elgin and Chicago areas. Uh, he's got a BA in English Literature from Benedictine University and a JD from John Marshall Law School. He's pretty much served on most local boards at one time or another, the Chamber, Rotary, Jane Shover, the YM, Centro de Información, Grand Victoria, and he's the founder of the Club Guadalupano Scholarship, which is now in its 24th year. Uh, he's practiced law in Elgin for over 20 years, and he's <coughs> served as the chairman of the Illinois Human Rights Commission uh, for 18 of those. He's now a U.S. bankruptcy judge for North the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, he has been for the last three years. He's an amateur historian of Mexican and Civil War history. Uh, he's also my brother-in-law, and uh, <laughs> if, there's, if there's any in dealing, it's here. This is where it's at. Anyhow, I'd like to welcome the Honorable Judge Mandy Barbosa. Thank you very much, Gilbert. I actually have a far more inflated bio that we use when I'm out of town and people don't know me, but I told Gilbert since most of you know me, we try to keep it simple. I apologize for walking in during the, uh, the midst of your luncheon, but I was, uh, as many of you know, in Rockford, and this morning we handled what we call the Chapter 11 cases. Chapter 11 uh, cases in bankruptcy are cases where businesses that are uh, having problems come in to get court assistance in order to reorganize and get back on their feet. Uh, and with that, I, I thought I would, uh, since, since Gilbert implied that listening to a speaker is not part of the fun, I thought I would share a little bit of bankruptcy humor with you. And there, is, uh, there is humor in bankruptcy court occasionally, believe it or not. And this involves the story of this uh, man whose business was suffering terribly. He was going down the tubes in the common parlance, and uh, he didn't know what to do. And he went to visit his minister and told him about his plight, how he was losing all hope and things were very desperate for him. And his minister said, my son, uh, do not lose hope. He said, do the following. He said, I want you to take your Bible, drive down to the beach, sit at the beach, open your Bible, let the gentle breeze from the ocean open it to a page, and you will find guidance and inspiration there. And the man, of course, followed the instructions, went to the beach, took his Bible, sat there. And, of course, time passed. About a year later, the minister sees this man pull into his driveway, driving a brand new Rolls Royce vehicle, comes up very nicely dressed to the door, knocks on the door, tells the minister that he's very grateful for the advice, hands him a large bag full of money. And the minister is very impressed. And he says, my son, I, I just have to ask you one question. He said, what, what page in scripture brought about this dramatic change? He said, chapter 11. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, I want to thank you once again for, for inviting me to this, this fine luncheon that you put on every year. About two or three years ago, I think I had a, a similar uh, privilege of being here. And at that time, I remember that I... I talked a little bit about how we have Plymouth Rocks all over this country, that wherever immigrants arrive full of hope and enthusiasm for this new land, the wonder of Plymouth Rock is being relived. I mentioned that we here in Elgin have that same opportunity that the Native Americans had, that very first harvest that they celebrated, with these new people who were so different and yet share the common humanity that did not depend on the common language or culture to be recognized. We, we not only have that opportunity to share and help others in this new land, but I would submit that many of us, particularly those of us who, who came to this country in the same fashion, have a moral obligation to do so. Uh, there are opportunities all around us to, to, to engage in that kind of activity. At Centro de Información is certainly a Plymouth Rock, St. Joseph's Parish, and 
many other places around this town where people can use a helping hand, a friendly welcome in their own language whenever possible. But I really didn't come here uh, this afternoon to talk to you about volunteerism or altruism because that would be kind of like going to talk to the people in Florida about the importance of voting. I think, <laughs> I think many of the people in this room have been at the forefront of advocacy and help for those newly arrived in our community for many years. Uh, when I was here a couple of years ago, I also mentioned that uh, on Thanksgiving, I'm thankful for living in a community where the overwhelming majority of people enjoy the diversity which Elgin offers. And the overwhelming majority of people in this community support efforts to make life a little bit better for those who are new to this town and need a little bit of help with, uh, with their new surroundings. However, I think anyone who, who reads the, our local Algen paper knows that not everyone in, the, in this community shares that point of view with respect to immigrants. Some say that mankind was given the gift of language so that they could conceal their true feelings. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that isn't always the case. And some people, particularly when they can avail themselves of anonymity, sometimes uh, espouse opinions which sound damaging and hurtful, but it, 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 uh, I think at their core, they perhaps reveal some problems that we need to address. Just picking up the paper this morning, I saw other samples. Uh, uh, some, I'm sure you've, you've all seen them. Uh, last Saturday, somebody was suggesting that uh, ads that appear in Spanish give uh, Spanish-speaking people better prices than people who, who don't speak Spanish. And uh, <laughs> if I had known that, I would perhaps revert back to my monolingual <laughs> Spanish uh, <laughs> days. Uh, somebody else suggested that someone who was rumored to have raised the flag perhaps a little higher than an American flag should be deported, and I've yet to find that in the immigration code. Someone, uh, finally somebody wrote Saturday suggesting that uh, perhaps uh, we've had enough of these type of uh, uh, calls in the uh, speak out column. And there was a, an interesting reply by the editor which said, but the point about allowing such comments in the paper is a difficult one we've wrestled with for some time. We don't really encourage negative comments of any kind, yet our goal is to permit wide-ranging discussion on issues of the day. Now that sounds very good. Our goal is to permit wide-ranging discussion. It seems to me that the range of the discussion has not been very wide, and certainly the level has been somewhat low. It seems to me that if the topic is as worthy of discussion as our newspaper thinks it is, then I think there's also an obligation to go beyond allowing a venting of anger and frustration. The words discussion of the issues of the day carry a, a grand and noble connotation, implying the exercise of one of our great rights under the First Amendment. But it also implies the lofty and worthy goal of healthy, constructive dialogue with a purpose. It implies elevating the level of discussion beyond the level of name calling. I would submit to the paper that the goal is not discussion for the sake of discussion, but discussion with the goal of illuminating at least some facets of the issue. I'm by no means saying that the topic should be outlived. I see that among the stated goals of this organization, and I'm paraphrasing very loosely, uh, to provide a forum for discussion of issues that ultimately lead to the betterment of our community. It sounds like your goal is somewhat similar to that comment stated by the paper, <coughs> and I would submit that you as an organization are uniquely qualified to raise the level of the discourse. Raising the level means acknowledging that not all problems related to immigration can be explained with accusations of racism and bigotry. It means that we must try not to be insensitive to those who have fears or concerns about our changing demographics and allay those unwarranted concerns while we understand their frustrations and fears. It may mean that we discover a moral obligation to help our new immigrants adjust in a manner that avoids conflicts with them. It means that we may have to stand in the shoes of the complainers and see if our responses are tempered and rational or do we also need to elevate the level of our discourse? 
when people advocate English as the national language with all the hidden agendas that that implies, do we immediately go into a defensive mode about our right to speak Spanish, giving a confrontational explanation of the historical justifications, etc., etc., or do we explain that English is, has been, and will remain the official language of this country, but that this country is strengthened and enriched, not threatened, by many people who speak Spanish, nor by the accommodation that we make for those who haven't learned English yet. We presently have over 600,000 Americans living in Mexico, and I predict that figure will soon surpass one million with the growing maquiladoras and other business relationships, as well as the growing number of baby boomers <coughs> retiring to warm, friendly, and inexpensive areas. In a small town outside Guadalajara, known as Ajiji by Lake Chapala, which many of you know, there are English newspapers. There's a large number of American organizations and of course a large number of Americans residing there in tranquility and harmony with their neighbors without a problem and nobody is offended by the presence of English newspapers. It is inevitable, it is inevitable that our differences will fade but we can hasten the day of understanding and promote harmony simply by elevating the level of discourse. As I was thinking about this I'm always worried when I, end up, when I write my speeches late at night after a long, hard day because uh, you never know what's going to come out and you're always <laughs> concerned about <laughs> offending someone. But I was sitting there with this little rubber band and I thought about how it illustrated for me the, the impact of elevating the level of discourse. When you elevate the rubber band, you tend to bring both sides closer together and it's you bring it down, both sides tend to be polarized. I think that's precisely the effect that the level of discourse has on groups. As the level of discourse is lowered, the polarization becomes more marked. On April 3rd of, 9th of 1863, and I mentioned to this table that I was going to work this in. <laughs> on April 3rd of 1863, President Lincoln proclaimed that the last Thursday of November will be set aside it's a day of thanksgiving, promoting family gatherings. At that time, this country was embroiled in a civil war, north against the south. There were four million foreign-born people in the north at that time. One half of them had arrived within the last 10 years. Tens of thousands of those foreigners helped keep this country together. There were even, believe it or not, Mexican groups in the northern infantry, and there was one regiment that was Mexican in New Mexico. These foreigners not only held this nation together, but in the words of Lincoln, they gave it a rebirth of freedom. Now, if we are to raise the level of discourse, we must value open-mindedness and critical thinking even more than we value leadership and leadership development. I bring that up because we as Hispanics seem to place so much emphasis on having leaders and developing leadership. We seem to associate the concept of leadership so intimately with our progress that we confer that title on so many people who presumably speak for all of us, make pronouncements that reflect our dreams and aspirations. They take positions on issues in a manner that has our best interests at heart. They tell us what, Latinos, what the Latino position is on every issue as though such a thing were possible in this complex world. If I may play devil's advocate, if I haven't already, let me suggest that we need fewer leaders and more thinkers. Some sociologists have suggested that certain immigrant groups or disadvantaged groups in various cultures have tended to develop more leaders, perhaps as a perceived solution to their plight. Yet there is no conclusive evidence that the real progress is correlated to the existence or quality of their leadership. There are certain groups which make remarkable progress as immigrants in diverse cultures throughout the world who have been remarkably, remarkably devoid of any notable leaders, such as uh, the in, it, even in incipient communities, such as Asians and Jewish groups. All too often, leaders tell us what to think, and again, they presume to speak for all of us. This not only ignores the vast diversity that exists under the broad umbrella that we call Hispanics, and let us be very clear that the word Hispanic does not exist anywhere else in the world but the United States. I think it is often condescending and even offensive to say this is the Hispanic position on that particular issue or this issue. 
it is important that we encourage all people to analyze issues on their merit and raise the level of the discourse to avoid polarization. We cannot tell our young people this is the Hispanic position on crime, education, or any other issue. In our zealousness to promote leadership and unity, we have forgotten the importance of promoting critical thinking among our people, and we place labels on those who, fall in, who don't fall in line with so-called conventional Hispanic wisdom. It is absurd that in the greatest democracy in the world, people often discourage the vigorous discourse that our complex issues deserve by labeling those whose opinions differ as being disloyal, insensitive, or unworthy of engaging in dialogue. Such attitudes ignore the great truth that all the world's monumental ideas or concepts evolved only as a result of being tested against competing concepts. We need to teach our young people how to think and not always tell them what to think. We can still be united in the pursuit of worthy common goals, but we should be free to openly discuss how we will get there without fear of being labeled if we veer from the conventional wisdom. For example, we can all agree that the annual deaths of hundreds of immigrants attempting to cross the border is a tragedy that warrants urgent action, yet we can exchange opinions as to sound immigration policies and causes and solutions to that situation. We can all agree that equal opportunity in the workplace is crucial and that Hispanics should be vigilant of their rights in this area yet we may differ on the role of affirmative action and how and whether it should remain a national policy. We can all agree that the education of our children is a top priority and that resources to assure the quality of that education are essential, yet we may be free to discuss the efficacy or means of implementing bilingual education and analyze it objectively without charges of insensitivity being used. To have so-called leaders endow certain positions with sacrosanct status is to deprive Hispanics of an essential privilege in the democracy, that is, full participation in the free marketplace of ideas. To allow this situation to exist in our community is to condone intellectual oppression and impede our development and maturity as a free people. A free and democratic society has no sacred cows, be they social programs or political ideas. A free society celebrates and promotes the free flow of ideas and recognizes that meaningful discourse is the true path to understanding and progress. Now, I realize we're all in a hurry to get back to work and there's, there's a little prayer that lawyers always say when they get up and ready to speak to a, to a jury in closing because as you all know, lawyers and judges just love to hear themselves talk. That, that, <laughs> prayer, that prayer goes something like this, Dear Lord, please fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and nudge me when I've said enough. I just <laughs> felt a very strong nudge. Thank you very much. <laughs>